Well, we'll find we'll out. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, here we are. So, copy. Uh, if, if, so, now let's say I want to, re to delete that folder that I created with mkdir. There's a command called rm, which is our uh, move, basically, or remove action. No, I think move and remove is almost the same. Um, now, here's a, an important thing where the, the options are very important. If I try to rm test, I don't think it's going to allow me to do that because the, uh, let's see what it tells me. Here it is. So it says test is a directory. So rm by default, or its, uh, its, its default option, is only to, to delete files, not directories. If I want to delete a directory, I need to use rm. By the way, what I did here, I used the up key, the up and down key on your keyboard, allow you to scroll to the last couple of, uh, or many even, uh, commands that you used before. So it's very useful if you want to do the up and down key on your keyboard. So I can just rm and uh, minus r well now it's minus r stands for recursive which in this case mean it's going to remove the entire folder uh, it's also commonly used if you want to do something to all the files in one folder that's going to use the minus r so now if i do if i hit enter it should delete it and if we do ls we'll find that it's no longer here all right, so making a folder, deleting a folder, that's sort of how you can do that. Um, other important thing I'm trying to think of for just managing, and, and again, now we are still just controlling this computer. We're not doing anything on any server or anything like that. Let me just think. Um, um, yeah, well, this. There's actually, let me show you something really quick while we're here. There's actually a lot of, I'm not an expert on that, and there's a lot you can learn about how to do that, but let's me, let me create the folder again. Um, and let's go into test. So now we're in the folder. Um, I want to show you a little bit about how to create a, a, a shell script. So what we are doing now is just kind of uh, prompting, right, to control that. But we can create a script to do all of that, a Linux shell script. Um, and let me see if I can do that. There's, um, there's a text editor within the Linux uh, terminal that's called VI or VIM. VI is the basic, VIM is the more, uh, more advanced, although to be honest, I'm not sure what the difference between them is. But VI, and then I give a name of a file, so let's call it uh, script.sh. SH is the typical extension of file type for a, for a, for a, for a Linux script. And by doing VI script name, it will supposedly, if I remember, create that file as well. And it did. Okay, I think it did. Let's, let's check that. Let's check that it really did that. So let's go to the desktop. And test. Ah, no, it's only going to, sorry, it's only going to uh, actually create the file when I save it. So for now, now VI if you go, for example, and do take a computer uh, programming class in computer science, basically all you do is use VI. They don't use any fancy IDLE like we did in Spider or anything like that. They just use this, which kind of the very uh, pure computer science thing, very geeky thing to do. But it's very useful because it's very easy, it's very lightweight, and you can use it. So let's. Let's create a, a command. Now, now the, the, the difficult thing about VI is that you need to know uh, all the command and it's only to be typed in. You can't just you know, use your, your mouse or anything like that. So you just created a new file. Well, it's not created yet. When I save this file, it's going to be created. 
but it's it's yeah. you know, I'm setting it up. Uh, how did you delete the test folder? Uh, the MKDR is to, to create to a new create yeah. how to delete RM minus, minus R. R. So what's the purpose of VI again? VI is a text editor within the Linux shell and what we're going to use it now is to create a simple script to do something. So let's let's do a script that do something simple. So in order to start typing, if I if I try to type now, oh, actually it's working. <laughs> I thought it's not going to Sometimes you need to uh, hit uh, Q to start typing. I guess in this case, it, Q, the Q key. Now it's actually working. Um, by the way, if I hit the escape key, now it means that it's ready to take my command. And commands, which as we'll see, you do the uh, this symbol, how, however you call it. I'm not sure. How do you call this symbol? Uh, colon. Sim. Yeah, colon. Yeah, colon. Yeah, colon. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, colon Q, for example, will quit. W Q will quit and save. W will just save it. I think there's all these millions of commands that we need to uh, to do. But if I want to go, so W will save my. W would, I think, will just save. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. But now I want to start typing, so I think I'm going to hit the Q key, yes, and I can start typing, okay? And you see it says insert recording. Now I can start recording. So let's do this. Let's do um, make mkdir, and what's a good name for, let's call it... Um, Another folder. Enter for a new line, and let's use the word the the um, the command echo. Echo is like print in Python. It, it just prints whatever something on the screen. And let's do echo. I think you need quotes. I'm not sure. Um, and let's say another. Folder was just and that's it. All right. So this is all this this uh, script is gonna do for us. So I hit Escape to exit the um, typing, and I'm gonna do colon W Q, which is I think if I remember, save and quit. All right, so now let's go and see what's going on. Here's our script. You see it was created. And actually, I can open it in a text editor. Um, so you see it's, it's here. So we did the right thing. And by the way, if I want to, I can do it in a text editor. I don't have to do it in VI. Text editor actually kind of easier to do. So but, can this be run in Spider? Um, no, Spider this? can't run shell scripts. No, this is only Python. So now, right, I have a script. If I want to run it, right, I want to run this script, I use dot slash and the name of the file that I want to run. And for some reason it doesn't let me. Uh, let's see. I may need to do another thing. Okay, uh, that's a good lesson. It's quite common. I don't know why it's doing that, but it's it's a good segue to what we I want to teach you next. You see, it tells me permission denied for some reason. I don't know why. Um, you see, it doesn't have a lot of permissions. Is it just uh, Yeah, usually you know you see drw whatever. It's only allow me to read it, not to execute it. So I want to read to teach you another command that allow you to change permissions. And it's called ch mode. Ch mode is change mode, um, and that allows you to change the mode without the permissions. Ch mode. Yes, ch mode. Can you see? You want me to make it bigger? Um, now, ch mode, when you use it for the first couple of times, the best thing to do is to actually go online and see uh, what the different options, because it has a lot of options. The most um, extensive permission that you can 
give to a um, to a file is has a code of seven seven seven. That's basically everyone can see it, everyone can execute it, everyone can delete it. That's like that's the, the most. You, a lot of people use 755 as well. Right? I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is, but 755 is the most common one. What I do, if I'm not too sure, I, I just Google CH mode, and there's actually, um, there's a, a site that allow you to kind of visually Maybe I, I should Google CH mode options. Yeah, I can't find it right now. But there's there's one that um, that allow you to enter what type of permission you want to give, and it will give you the code that is associated with it. I can't find it. Right Are you using tab key while writing? Tab key? Tab key on the keyboard. Ah, no, it's not going to let you do that because this is a specific code that you need to enter. Uh, so it's not about which file. The tab only works if you want to complete like a, what, what file location it is. But anyway, for uh, 7, 777 or 755 is kind of the, the permission that you usually need. Sorry. And then you say the name of the file, which is scripts.sh, and that should change the permission. Let's do lsl. And you see now it's much more, there's a lot more, and I bet we can run it now. By the way, if you want to change the permission for a folder, um, you should use ch mode minus r, and then the code, and then the, uh, the name of the folder. So this minus R, and sometimes it needs to be capital R. I'm not sure exactly what the rule for that. Um, so now CH mode, 777 minus R? And no, then minus R and then 777. Uh, and that's just a way to, uh, to um, yeah, to change a folder instead of a file. Uh, so the name of the folder should be uh, the last in, in, uh, in quotations? No. No. Okay. Uh, sir, what did you do to ex execute this script? You, uh, you I didn't execute the script yet. How did you uh, get permission denied yet? Ah, yeah, well, yeah, I tried to execute it, yeah. it didn't let me. So it's point slash forward slash and the name of the script. And let's see if it works. Well, it, it printed the text and it created this folder, so it did work. All right? So we created a script, we ran the script, we use VI, we can use the text editor if you want to on, on the Mac. Uh, but for example, if you interact with the server, um, I, don't talk, I don't think I have the time today to show you how to, um, to, to do like a Dropbox style interaction with the server. But right, if you, if, what we're gonna do now, for example, we're gonna log in, the next thing we're gonna do is gonna log in into the server and then uh, we won't have access to visually to the folders, right? We need to do it all through the command uh, prompt. So anyway, um, I think that's all the basic stuff I had about interacting, but let's go to actually see what we can do. Um, and there's obviously a lot more to learn. Actually, Tasmo has gone through the uh, Text to the little book, right? So we can teach you about some other stuff. Why do you uh, type ls minus l? And it's just to to give you a more detailed uh, list of what's on your phone. So if I uh, type only l, l, ls. Yeah. Let's see, let's let's see. Ls. This is what I get. Oh. Ls l. You get just more detail. Um, all right. So to log in to UAHPC. You need to do the following. You need to, so my username is s o n 2 at uahpc.ua.edu. Now, before I click OK, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. SSH and then this. 
SSH is the command to, SSH is a communication protocol basically, and this is how you connect. Now the reason why I need to put in my username is because I'm using Miriam's computer and this is her username. So if you try to log in and you're doing it from your own computer and the username on, on the Mac is the same as the username on the UAH PC, you only need to do this. You don't need a username because it will know to use that existing username. But that's not the case for me, so I'll do this. Now I click OK. The first time you do it, it's asking you, I don't know, or telling you, I don't know what this UAHPC is. Are you sure you want to connect to it? And so you need to type yes. And this is only the first time you do it on a computer. And now it's asking you for the password. So hopefully you know what your password is for the UAHPC. This is not your computer password. It's your server password. So whatever you defined over there. Not Did the you? It's, it's the same? not the same for me. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's, uh, I think automatically it's the Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we are connected to the, um, to the server. Um, and it looks the, the same. Or the only see, thing you, you will see is that it says, you know, your username at UAHPC. So the interaction here is the same as just what I showed you. But I want to, 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 to I guess there are three places that you can um, store files and uh, basically that are your home locations, if you will. One is called home. So if I do PWD, you see I'm currently, that's my default location, home slash S coin 2. So if I go one back, CD, and do FS, these are all the people right now that have a directory on home. And I don't know if you can find yourself there, but uh, maybe not. I think there are multiple home. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's go back. The disadvantage home have very small quota, so it's not advisable to try to save a lot of big files over there. It's good for small files. So uh, this, this person uh, yeah. using the supercomputer? Yeah, this is, a, this is a folder on the supercomputer that you um, have once okay. you have an account. Um, and I can save stuff to it if I want. Uh, at the moment, I don't have anything there because it's very small. You can't really save a lot. There is also something called big home. So cd slash big home. Big home. And big home, as the name suggests, is much bigger. So you can store, I don't know what the quota is, but it's quite big, uh, definitely more than home, and you can ask for it to be bigger if you need to. Or you can use my big home if you uh, promise to play this. Um, because a lot of the stuff, so Tasmo, especially for you, a lot of the stuff that we run, we run the model from big home. So, you know, Sean and, and, and uh, Tom, they all use that, but you can open your own Folder, you don't have a folder there by default, but if you do mkdir and your name, your username, you can create your own folder. And I think you're going to be allowed to do that. I'm not 100% sure. So let's go to my uh, directory. So there's a few stuff there. Um, um, all right, so in terms of the model, itself, the WBM said model, as you can see there's a lot of stuff there um, and I guess we don't need to really go to all the details right now. Uh, the, the model is a very complex one so it, it has a lot of input data sets and they are stored in different locations which makes it a little confusing. Uh, RGIS archive, which is this folder over here, is where most of the input parameters, most of the input data sets for the WBM said models are stored. So RGIS archive, and I can go into it like CD, RGIS archive, and there's a folder called global, and uh, what is it? Ah, sorry, yeah, no, this 
I scratch that for a minute. By the way, if you want to go several steps back, so if I do cd slash slash and then another slash slash, it will go two oh, steps. Two steps. Yeah, and you can make a million of them if you want. Uh, so the most of the WBM said input parameter are in, in what's called CCNY. It stands for City College New York, which is where the original framework was developed. So it's not in RGS archive? No, it's actually there is a folder there called RGS archive. That's why I was confused. So RGS archives and and you see there's different domains. We use global in most cases. And you'll see there's a lot of stuff. So every one of these folder contain a different input parameters. So population, network, uh, air temperature, you know, uh, you know, basically everything that the, the model needs to run. And um, yeah, it's just there. We don't really need to interact with, uh, we don't really need to change it unless we introduce a new input data set. That's where, uh, or we need to update something. So the model itself, the model and the script that runs it are in WBM set runs. And you can see that Sean, for example, created his own version for that. You, you can do that as well. Uh, so let's go to the difficult, the, the, the default one, WBM set run. And as you'll see, I'm not a very good example of data management. I have a lot of folder management. I have a lot of different ones. And because sometimes when I uh, make improvement to the model, I, I like to just create a new, completely new version of it. So I, and I don't want to delete the old one. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But if you do, for example, NSL, you can see the date in which it was created. And you can sort of find the latest one, although it doesn't tell you about Because these are pretty old, I've made many different, many changes since. So I guess it only tells you when the folder was created, not so much when it was edited. But the, I tried to get to be a good in terms of identifying the, the, the versions. Actually, this is the version that we are that I'm currently working on, even though there's newer ones, because these are more experimental. I'm not yet used them. So let me go to one and I'll show you what's inside because that's pretty standard. So let's go to WBM said uh, 3.1 uh, fixed B fixed. Yeah, fixed DE. Okay, each one of these will have two folders which are very important. One is called model, which is where the actual model code is. And if you change the model, this is where you do it. Right, and the second one is called scripts, which is where the scripts that run the models are stored. So let's go to, um, you know what? It would probably be easier for me just to download one of these and show it to you visually instead of using this. So let me actually teach you, use this opportunity, and I'll teach you how you can download stuff and upload stuff to your computer from a server. At some point I'm going to teach you how to do it a little bit more seamlessly without using the command prompt, but for now I guess it's going to be pretty good. Um, I'm going to start a new uh, shell. Actually, this one seems to have tabs as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So there is a new tab. So when you open a new tab, you're now back in your computer. You're not in the, the new tab is not on the server. It's still here. I didn't want to log out. That's why. But this is now looking at the computer. There's a command called scp. So cp is copy. So if you want to copy a file from one location to the next or folder, you use the cp command. scp is copying from a server using the SSH protocol. So the scp um, command works this way. You need to identify the first thing you do is you identify the location of the folder that you want to copy or the file. 
So we want to copy this folder, WBM set 3.1, blah, blah, blah. So what I do, look at this trick. I use, I'm, I'm back in the, on the server, PWD. So I know this is the location, right? So I just copy it. Here, back on the computer, I'm just uh, people are excited about, about the game. game. <laughs> uh, so, S Cohen 2, this is my username, at UA dot, not UA, uh, UA HPC dot UA dot EDU, colon, and I'm just going to do command V to uh, paste the location. Of, so this is the folder that I want to copy, and let's say I want to copy it to uh, users, Miriam, desktop, and let's do the test that I just created. All right. So take note. This is I know it's a big command, but it's it's important. So SCP is the name. Ah, I forgot something very important. Minus R. So uh, I'm doing on my yeah, if you do it from on your computer from one folder to the next, you don't need the whole no. username at UAHPC and all that. You just do uh, the, this folder and uh, space and that folder. This is where it's going. Um, and I can show you. Uh, okay, so I forgot the minus R, which is what I need to do. And okay, so I'm gonna hit enter. It's gonna ask me for a password again, the password for the server. Basically, what it's doing now, it's going to the server and asking for permission to copy that folder. So I'm gonna type in my uh, password. It's gonna take a little while. There's a lot of stuff. And it's done. All right, so now if you go here, here it is. And let's make it bigger somehow. All right, so I don't know if it's better or not. Can you see OK? I mean, um, let me try again to make it. All right, so we have two folders in the model, the WBM set model. As I said, script and model. Let's start with the model. The model itself, at least at the moment, this architecture actually tends to change a little bit. Um, it has three folders. The CMLib and the MFLib are libraries that relates to the model run and stuff like that you don't need to change them you don't need to, mod to modify them unless there's a new architecture that comes from the ccny group and we need to change that because sometimes they, they change this but uh, for now we don't need to worry about it this is actually will be important these two when you try to install this model on a different computer because then Linux is kind of funny this way. You need to recompile all the dependencies for a specific uh, model, I guess. So if you take this now and you try to run this model on this computer, which is possible, um, you need to uh, recompile MFLib and CMLib, right? Just so you know. But if it's on the server, I've already done that, so you don't need to do that. Why don't you? Let us run the model in these computers. Well, we can try. There's uh, a bunch of dependencies that you need to install. It's not you can't just run it right now. You need to install uh, specific libraries, which is possible. I've done that before. Um, we can definitely do that. But it just you know it will really slow you down. It's, it's pretty heavy duty computer. Um, anyway, the WBM Plus is where the actual model is sitting. I know you can't really see very well. Uh, the important thing here, there are two important folders. The first one is bin. Bin is where the executable are stored. Executable is just like 
if you will, in, in Windows, right, when you have .exe. It's somewhat similar to that. It's called .bin in Linux. You can double click and run it. It's not, it doesn't work like that. But this is where, when you make a change to the model and you recompile it, this is where it's going to be saved. So at the moment, I have two versions of it because I created two different versions. Uh, one of them is no, ban no BF, which means no bank full. So it kind of runs the model without the bank full module. Um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, they include an ob 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 objective that's not very important. The SRC is actually very important. This is where all the source code is. So all the C files that, that uh, um, what the model is are in the SRC folder. And that's pretty typical architecture for any Linux-based um, program. It has the SRC folder and the bin, right? It's it's not something unique to this uh, to this model, right? It's pretty much any program in in, uh, in Linux. Uh, so let's see, for example, here's bad blood. You see Tasmo bad load flux. It's a C file, and we can open it as a text file. Don't double click. Just go to open with uh, let's say text wrangler. This is my default. So this is just a C command, C folder, uh, a C sorry, C script. That I mean, I'm not going to go into the exact syntax that we need. There's a very specific for this model, uh, but this is how it looks. This is how you would change it. If you need to change something, this is the file that you would change the model itself. Um, uh, and then after you change it, you need to compile it. So just changing the text is not enough. You need to compile it, and I can show you when the time comes. If you do need to do that, we can, I can show you how to do that. Um, the next folder that I want to show you is that script. This is more likely the one that you need to use because this is uh, where you. This is how you run the, the model, and the way WBM set is, is set up, or WBM is set up. It has that C files and the C executable, but that C executable, after you compile it and it's now ready to be used, it's controlled by those shell script, the .sh script that you see here. And there's a lot of them just because, as I told you, I'm not very good at deleting stuff, so there's all these versions, uh, but really all you need is one. Um, so let's open one that is uh, fairly recent. Um, let's see. I think this is should be pretty new. And again, you can open it in text wrangler. Um, now this is a very <laughs> complicated uh, shell script, and the manual. The WBM said manual tried to explain a lot of the options that are uh, in here. And I, can, I guess I can, but I can. I thought we can zoom in a little bit. Um, um, yeah, I don't want to really go into that right now of how to modify, but this is basically how you control the model behavior after you. So, not the parameters, but actually, so what's the name of the inputs? What outputs are going to be generated? Where are you going to save the output to? Um, you know, what type of, for example, evapotranspiration module you're going to use? So all this stuff that you control the model uh, outside of the, the actual code itself is done with that shell script. This is why it's a little bit more complicated. So it doesn't, it doesn't input your values uh, no, you do. This is where, it, so uh, I'll try to explain it differently. You write the model, right? The model will calculate the hydrology, for example. Right? And it has a certain number of equations and all that. Uh, and the model also has input parameters, like let's say precipitation and evapotranspiration and temperature and so on and so on. Uh, but you want to make a model um, generic enough that you can input different data sets without needing to change the code itself. So the code is independent of the input. 
you create the code, it's ready to use, and if you do your, do your work well, it's, uh, you can use any input parameters. So this you. is the code? No, this okay. is actually the, the where you enter all the parameters. We can change. The code is what the B was, basically. The C files and the B. What's called the model form. The script and folder. C, I mean, source files. Yes, exactly. Okay. This is the code itself for the model. And the script folder is how you execute in large. Basically what the model, it's a very complicated framework. But basically what it's doing, it's once you launch the model or the program, it's going to go and read this file and figure out, okay, what's my input, what's my output, where is it, blah, blah, blah. All the, all the big list of stuff it, that needs to control it. Then it goes and starts fetching those you know, from the computer and, and do whatever it is it needs to do, and then it writes the stuff to the output. So basically the shell script initializes the model run, then the C takes over, if you will, the code itself takes over, do all the calculation, and write it to where you asked it to write. So this is how, think about this as like the group, like a, like the interface in, a, in an ArcGIS um, tool, right? You launch a tool, it gives you all these options. You need to fill them yeah. in. Okay. This yeah. is like yeah. this, yeah. basically. Yeah. So then you, when you click OK, ArcGIS take over and does all the calculation in the background. And if you want to change how the tool is behaving, like basically you need to go to the tool itself in ArcGIS uh, and do that. But uh, this is like the GUI, the interface that you and again, it's very complicated, but uh, I try to uh, explain all of it in the manual that we have for our, for WBM set. So if you do need to use it, uh, the manual will be helpful, and obviously I can help you uh, figure that out is as that, well. Is there a graphical user interface for WBM set? No. Um, in general, um, you know, uh, using supercomputers, you don't have any. I mean, you can, but it's not, not very. Okay, so once you have your script ready and the model ready and everything is ready on the computer, which it is, um, you need to launch that file, right? You need to execute it, basically. Now, you could do point slash the name of the script, right? You can do that, and it will work. The problem with this what it's going to do is going to start the model in what we call the head node. The, the head node, the way uh, supercomputers work, they have a head node, which is a computer basically, and that computer is connected to a lot of different computers. That's why it's called a cluster, because it's a cluster of computers. Um, they don't look like this, obviously, they, they look like a pizza tray, actually, and you've probably seen them on you know, television or something. And we can go actually and check them out at some point. Um, but anyway, the head node is basically controlling everything. So once you uh, do something, it will... Uh, so you shouldn't run um, any program on the head node because then the risk is it's going to really um, um, occupy it and other people will not be able to log in and do anything because then you took over. <laughs> Basically, and the head node is, is like is completely occupied with something, and it will warn you if you try to do that. Um, you can, but you shouldn't. All right. So what you do in a supercomputer is you use a, a queue. That's why I told you when you sign in to uh, the uh, UAHPC, use my username, because then you are in my group and we have preferential queuing because I bought one. Of we, have, uh, we are stakeholders in that system. So let me teach you very quickly of how to do that. It's not very difficult, just need to figure that out. So there's actually a, another shell script here that's called s batch underscore owner. The name is not important. You can call it whatever you want, uh, but what's inside is important. So I'll open it in, in text render again. Now, as you can see, it's much simpler. The first line that whatever bash, bin bash, that's just something that needs to be there. We don't worry about that. The next, I don't know, six, seven lines um, 
provide information about the different requests that you make. Basically what you're making now, you're requesting the system to run your program. That's what you do. It is a specific language that you use in order to make that request. And so for example, job name is what's the name of the job, which is just for your own sake. Actually the system doesn't care, but uh, I call it destiny, density, just the, the name of, uh, of a job that I did. Um, actually this should be C. That was a mistake that I made at some point. So slash uh, uh, minus C8 is I'm requesting eight cores because that's what my model can use. All right, so I'm requesting eight cores. I'm requesting that you use the owner queue because, and this is something that you can do as well because we are part of the owner queue. So this is what the, the uh, minus P of option is. The QoS is the name of the user, I guess. I don't know what it is, but this is my username. Um, I think you can, you should probably use your own username for this. Uh, this tells it or ask it to generate an error file. This is where it's going to write all the if there's an error, because the thing is, once you run it, you send it, you don't see any feedback. Basically, it's it's gone. So if you don't put the error and output folders, uh, it's basically going to generate an, uh, an error text file that once the program fails, it's going to give you the error in there. So you can, double, you can open that text file and see what went wrong. So it's very important actually, uh, because you, you will get error. The output is less important, but it just gives you the log basically of what just happened. Um, Mail user, for some reason, doesn't work, but it's supposed to, or maybe I didn't do it or didn't write it properly, but it's supposed to give to send you an email when the job is done. Basically. For some reason, that doesn't work. Here is just how you run the model. So forward slash, dot forward slash, the name of the script, right? That script that we, uh, we I just showed you, WBM said fixed B. Dot sh and these are inputs that the model script requests from you. So this is specifically for this model. Uh, the first of the first input is global, which is what domain you're gonna work at. So most of what we do is global. The second one is the resolution we're gonna use, which is 0606 minute um, in this case, and the third one is either dist or prist. Um, which is, uh, this is for disturbed, which means that it uh, activates all the anthropogenic parameters like dams and irrigation and, and so on. And priest is pristine, which doesn't have. Um, so this is, this is specific inputs that this uh, shell is requesting. So let me show you. Now we are now on Miriam desktop, which is not very helpful because we can't run it from here. So let's go back. Uh, let's go back to the terminal uh, and go back to the UAHPC. So let me show you something. All right, let's say I try to run uh, WBM said CD scripts. Yeah. Now let's try to run one of these folders. Uh, point. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to run it. It's going to give me an error. It's going to tell me, first of all, I shouldn't do that because then it will launch the program on the head node, which is not what we want. But I want to show you that. It's gonna complain that I didn't give it this. It's this true inputs, which is the global zero six minute and, and this. 
Yeah, you, you see it says, um, well, it give me a lot of errors, I guess, but uh, <laughs> it's basically said you need to give me domain, resolution, and whether you want the disk or priest. So let me show you how to run it properly into the queue. So there's a, a function called um, um, s batch backward or smaller than I guess that's the right symbol and then um, uh, the name of the s batch dot owner script. All right, so let me repeat what I just did. What this command is s batch is the it's part of the 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 cluster queuing protocol. So s batch is a command in that protocol that says I want you to to submit uh, a job. And this smaller than symbol I don't know where it's coming from, but that's how you do it. Uh, and it says this is the file. This is the bash. The, the script that, that has all those options, right? What's the name of the job? How many nodes? How many, you know, all that the, stuff that I just that's showed. That's what you just showed. Yes. So you know the name. That's yes. Okay. Because I agree. <laughs> uh, you can call it anything you want. It doesn't need to be. Um, this is just a name I call it, but you can call it anything. You can call it Miriam. <laughs> you just need no, to. I am just no, 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 sure no. It's important because it's not like this name is not important. It's just the the name that I chose for this script. So if if I click enter, uh, it's going to say submitted job number. There's a, a specific ID, and you basically get no feedback right now if the job is successful, is not successful, is it pending, if it's running. There is a command now. There's a bunch of commands that allow you to investigate. So one of them is s jobs and our job. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, sorry. It's called sq. SQ will give all the jobs that are currently running or in queue. On the cluster, so you see it says the job ID, the, uh, um, the job ID, the partitioner, is it owner, is it main, uh, the name, how his, ours, the user, the time. So this is a good sign. It says it's our means that it's running. Q means that it's queuing, it's in queue, and if you don't see it, it means that it's crashed. Um, and because it's such a long list, what I like to do is SQ minus u and then my username. What this is going to do is going to just show my my jobs, not anyone else's. Right? So we see uh, the, the ID, the petition, meaning it's an, in the owner queue, the name, and all that. It also tells you where, which computer, which node is it currently running at, and how many nodes, and so on. And how long has it been running. Um, now, um, there are a couple of different queues that you can use. You don't have to use the owner. Actually, the owner is limited to 16 because I only bought one node. So you, can, you can only run two WBM set jobs at eight cores each. Um, but you can use the other queues. You can use the long queue which allow you, I guess, I don't know, two weeks of runtime. You can use the main queue, which only allow you to run stuff for 24 hours, I think, but it's bigger. Uh, there's high memory queue if you need a lot of uh, RAM and so on. Now, for now, I don't want this to run, so... Um, when does it say 121, the time? This is just the time elapsed since it stopped running, so it's increasing. Okay. Right. So uh, how, how do you know to complete your execution time? How long does it take? Yeah, how long? Uh, Monica. Oh. Yeah, I should have a meeting with um, Well, I know from experience, but you can actually, so let me show you something. Um, 
I usually save my stuff to a, a, a different directory called uh, groups1, grps1. This is, I basically bought memory allocation on that. It's two terabyte that we have available because big home is small. There's also something called Scratch, which uh, you can uh, save stuff, but it only allow you every month they, they scratch it. So you can't save stuff for long. Um, so groups one, and I have a directory, and you're welcome to use it as well. And uh, you may be able to even uh, create your own. Uh, so you see Tong had one there, and Sean Carter has one. So I usually write to the WPM set runs. Now, uh, in a nutshell, I kind of need to finish because I, I'm meeting with Monica. The WPM set create two main folders. The first one called GDS, and this is where it's uh, saving its intermediate files. It's actually a fairly inefficient uh, model in, in, the, in the way that, because it, the, the data sets are so big, what it needs to do, it needs to read the data set from the hard drive, um, manage or rewrite or write it into an intermediate folder in a different format, and then calculate the results and always write in the results for that year and then when it's when it's done with one year it writes the the output of that year to a new folder called RGIS results so it's kind of a, a complex uh, simulation time but let's go to the uh, GDS, GDS and this one global just and Network. Okay, here it has three folders and one file. The global network called six.ds, that's the network file. So this is the, the stream network, this or the river network that it, it's using, and that's one of the first things that it will try to generate. Uh, all right. We have the common and disturbed. These are intermediate input files that it writes and it writes them on a yearly basis so every year it will write a new one so it will basically what it's going to do it's going to write all the input the intermediate input for that year let's say 1980 going to do all the calculation for 1980 going to write the result to RGS results and now start from 1981 so gonna, there's also a spin up cycle that you need to do but that's a different story um, so a, a really good indication of whether the model is running or doing something reasonable or it's the timing is to go to the, in this case, the Glim is the name that I gave this simulation. Um, so this name can be anything, basically. Glim. So there's a, a long list of files. This is an old simulation, so it already has, you see, all the way to 2010. But basically, this is where all these files are going to be written. So when the model is, is working, it's almost always going to write something to that folder. So this folder is very active. It's only going to stop writing when uh, it's going to write the output to the RJS result, which can take, can take some, some time as well. Um, so now, let's say I want to kill this uh, job because I already ran this simulation. So we said uh, SQ. Um, actually, I can use the. Here it is. Yeah, so I do S um, cancel, I think. Cancel. And the name, the, the ID. Did I? Okay, so it's not. So this is how you kill a, program, a, a, a job while it's running. The S cancel and the ID of that job. All right, so um, that was a crash course. And by the way, if you want to exit from the UAHPC, you can either just close 
um, you know, the terminal, or you can type exit, and you're out. So it says connection close. Um, just to give you a, 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 a really quick introduction, I told you that what I do, for example, I do all my simulation, but I, I like the fact that I have a visual way to interact with the files instead of from the command prompt. So there's a, a software or a package you can download. It's called um, Fuse, Mac Fuse, Mac Fuse. And um, you may need some help in figuring out. It's not that simple, but you need to install this package. And then you can write a command, and I have the script for that. And once you do that, if everything went well, you basically, if you go to Finder, you'll see just like any other folder, basically. It's connected directly to the server, and you can interact. It's like Dropbox, basically. You know how Dropbox, you can install it locally, um, which I, I don't know if you guys do that, but you, Dropbox or UA Box can be just like a native folder. On the so it's, uh, I use it a lot. It's very much, much easier than using you know, the, 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 the command prompt. So you can try and install that. It's, it's, it's not that easy, but uh, actually for your computers, because you still, most of you probably didn't update the uh, Mac operating system, you can use a, 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 a program called um, Mac Fusion, Mac Fusion, which is a little bit easier to use. And the instructions are also And there's an instruction of how to use it. It's very visual. You basically define the you know the uh, location of that server and what's the address, and you do mount. And once you do mount and it's successful, you just see it as a native folder on your Finder. So it's very eager. I use that for so where the number of use of the module written into to RJS results. RJS results. So. Yeah. But you can actually change the name. You, you control. All so you can you tell it where you want it to save it. It comes in text format. Text yeah. for your eye. Well, how do you do the results? Yeah. No, um, the results uh, come as um, binary files that are in a native language of the na native format for WBM. It's called GDBC. But what I do, I download all the. GDBC files to my own computer and convert them to NetCDF. And NetCDF is much easier to use because there's a, you can use Python, MATLAB, anything, even ArcGIS to, uh, to interact with NetCDF. So I, I use NetCDF. You can't use uh, CSV or rasters or whatever because, except, okay, so, our, so WBM have, for each year, it will generate three files. Two, two or three files, depending on what you give it. A yearly average, so it's going to average all the model predictions for all the for each parameter for that year, so 1980, 1981, so as many years as you decided. A monthly average, so that's going to have 12 layers, and then a daily average or daily prediction. It's not average. Um, so then you have 365. That's why you can't. You you need to use NetCDF or something because. It's one file that contains 365 layers. So that's the DF so allow you to do that. So those three files are uh, daily? For one, for, no. Daily? Yeah, daily, so monthly, and yeah. yearly for one year. For one year, yeah. And so if you have 10 years, you have 30 of them. And so on. But you can also say that if you're not interested in daily, because the daily files, each one of them is 10 gigs, um, you can say that you only want monthly and yearly. So you, you save a lot of space because um, most of what we do we don't we do. So what, what is the resolution six minutes? Six minutes is uh, about eleven kilometers by eleven kilometers. So grid cells are about Oh okay. Six minute splash out the the, the, the temporal resolution is daily. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, let's go see.